Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Pastor Bergen for another opportunity to uh, stand before you all and bring forth the word this morning. Uh, the title of my message uh, this morning is The Guy in the Jungle. The Guy in the Jungle, coming out of Romans chapter 10. And, uh, you know, if you've been witnessing any given time, uh, any time now and, and preaching the gospel, you probably came across someone who may just have this question that says, well, what about the guy in the jungle? The guy in the jungle who never heard of the Lord and the guy in the jungle who never heard of God's word and never got an opportunity to hear the gospel. What about that guy in the jungle? You know, what about him? And, you know, this uh, sermon here, uh, really, I, this is a, is a thought that I have been thinking on for, uh, uh, for a few years now, but never actually thought to put it to a actual full-length sermon. And like I said, that's often a statement that I know I came across it a few times, but uh, it's, it's really, to me, how I look at it, it's, it's a legitimate question. You know, what about the guy in the jungle? So I, I think that's a fair question. But then you have to also think about the motives of the people who actually ask that type of question as well, because you have people who will ask that question and they're looking, you know, to really put a damper on the work that you're doing uh, as far as preaching the gospel. Like if you're preaching in your local area, they may have a problem and say, well, you only preaching it here. What about the guy in the jungle? You know, and then you have some who just maybe putting a, a wet blanket on the gospel as far as, you know, does it really work? You know, is it really reaching all nations and everything? So I really wanted to uh, really touch on that statement. And the purpose of this sermon is that we're just going to really just put that statement to rest. You know, and any type of arguments uh, against it where people say, well, you know, it's a guy in the jungle and, you know, that guy out there, you know, he's just left alone. Well, by the end of the message, we will be able to see clearly that there is not a single individual that comes into this world and will not have an opportunity to have an opportunity to receive that gift of eternal life. It's just impossible for someone to come into this world and die never hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so. For one, uh, picking up in Romans chapter 10, look at verse, uh, obviously we, you can just look at the Romans road. If you use a lot of Romans uh, scriptures in your gospel presentation, you probably go to uh, Romans chapter 10 where he's talking about in verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that's a common verse that people use. And uh, this is just a good chapter in general about the gospel. And how, you know, uh, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I like to use that verse as a closeout when I'm giving my presentation. But in general, this, this entire chapter here, especially how he starts out talking about the Jews, how he's desiring that they would be saved. In general, he gets into later on about the gospel and how it has gone out into the entire world. And uh, as I mentioned, the title of the message, The Guy in the Jungle, and you say, well, what, what verse in here has to deal with a guy in the jungle? Well, you look at verse uh, 17, the Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Notice verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. So you're talking about a guy in the jungle who never heard the word of God. Well, notice what he said in verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Now, I want to be specific here because we got some pronouns in here that says they, right? So the question is, well, who is he talking about? Because we just, obviously, we read the entire passage of Scripture. But for sermon's sake, we want to make sure we have the right context as to who he's talking about. Because when he say have uh, they not heard, the they that he's talking about is talking about the world. And the, in general, everyone in the world. Well, we know that he's talking about that because the remainder of the verse says, yes, verily their sound went into all the earth. So we know when he says they, that he's talking about the world in general. But then we also know this, that he's talking about the world in general, because verse 19, he gets specific and say, but I say, did not Israel know? So he's now making it specific. Did not Israel know? And he says he has two examples to let you know that, yes, Israel knew of the coming Christ. They knew of the coming uh, Messiah and the Savior. Yes, they knew. So he says, but I say, did not Israel know? Here's the two people that he bring up to remind you, like, yeah, they knew. 
He says, first, Moses. Moses is the first example. First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But then he says in uh, verse 20, here's the second one. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. And, of course, this is talking about how, yes, the Lord reached out. But then, okay, well, now he's going to another people who was not looking for him, and yet they're found of him. This is talking about the people of the world when the gospel is going out. But in verse 18, for specifics of our sermon, but I say, have not they heard? This is talking about the world, and we're talking about the guy in the jungle. He says, yes, verily their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Well, first and foremost, let's go back to Psalm chapter 19. Let's get the root of this verse. Where does this verse come from? And hold your finger there because we'll flip back and forth between these two verses. Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So Psalm chapter 19, we'll see where this is generated from, this 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 uh, statement here. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, the Bible says, the heaven declared the glory, the heavens declared the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Notice this here, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is going out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And them has he set a tabernacle for the sun. So let's uh, do a quick explanation of what, he talk, what, he, what the Lord is talking about here. He's talking about nature. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about nature, and in specifics, he say the heavens declare the glory of God. And he says the firmament, which is another word for the heavens, showeth his handiwork. He says in verse 2, day unto day uttereth speech. Now here's the thing. When he say day unto day uttereth speech, this is talking figurative. This is not literal, uh, you know, uh, literal. It's figurative language. So he says, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night uttereth, uh, excuse me, showeth knowledge. So what is he saying here when he say day unto day? He's talking about the daylight. The daytime, the daylight uttereth speech. Now, is it physically talking, saying words? No, this is figurative. But what he's saying is that you have the daytime. And it utters speech. And then he says, and the nighttime, what comes after daylight? It's nighttime. And then he says, night unto night showeth knowledge. Then he says, remember, we, we're talking, some, we're using some pronouns here as well. He says, there is no language, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Well, who is he talking about when he says that there's no speech or language where their voice is not heard? He's talking about day unto day. He's talking about the nighttime. There is no speech nor language where their voice, daytime and nighttime, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So you say, well, what does that mean? Well, here's a good example. Right now, day unto day is being spoken of. It is uttering speech here in Atlanta right now. But 12 hours from, well, ahead of us right now, let's just say it's China or so, 12 hours ahead of us. Well, what would it be over there? Nighttime over there. So day unto day is uttering speech over here in Atlanta. It's daytime here, and night unto night is uttering its knowledge over in China. And what he's saying is there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So day unto day will hit us here in Atlanta, and then day unto day will then hit China as well. When it's sunlight, daylight in China, what will it be here? It would be nighttime here. So we see that day unto day, it's uttering this speech. No matter what language you speak, you will experience daytime and you will experience nighttime. Whether you live in America, whether you live in China, whether you live in Australia, whether you live in Africa, you will, regardless of your language, you will experience both daylight and nighttime is what the scripture is saying here. And then notice in verse 4, their line is going out. Well, who is there? Who are we talking about? Daylight and nighttime. Verse 3, for uh, context sake, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is going out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now, does day really have actual language that it speaks? 
No. Does the nighttime actually speak words as we're speaking? No. But what he's saying is that when it comes to the nature, when it comes to daylight and nighttime, every language that is under the heaven get a chance to experience daylight and nighttime. Does that make sense? So no matter where you are in the world, the Lord is saying daylight will come upon you. Nighttime will come upon you. That's what he's saying. No matter your language, you will experience both. Now, going back to Romans chapter 10, why would Paul insert this same exact scripture here concerning the gospel? In Romans chapter 10, verse 18, but I say, have not they heard? Who is they? He's talking about the world. Have not they heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So he brings up this verse because just like nature and the sunlight and the daylight and the stars and every all that come upon you here in America, it's all also going to pass on the person that's over in Africa as well. And he's saying the gospel is the same way. It's going to hit all nations, regardless of your language. Regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your background, it is going to hit every single person in this world. So he's tying, using those words, yes, verily their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So we're comparing daytime and nighttime to the gospel as well that it's going to hit and come upon everyone. Now you say, well, what's the big deal about this? Because what is the title of the message? What about the guy in the jungle? What about the guy in the jungle who, who never heard of the Lord? And, and he's out there in the, in, the, in the wilderness of Tanzania. He's out there with orangutans and everything. He's out there with monkeys. He's ooh, ooh, ah, ah, in, in the jungle. they like, what about that guy? Well, according to the word of God, yes. Verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. Now, if I wanted to, we can just end the sermon here, right? Isn't that enough scripture to just say, well, clearly the gospel is in every part of the world. When people make this statement, what about the guy in the jungle? Like I said, sometimes it's sincere and sometimes people just look into, you know, cause a little havoc and just want to really, you know, put a, a damper on the gospel. But they say two things uh, concerning this, well, or how, I look, how I look at it, is that it's two things that they say that, you know, you, you just really think about, and the word of God just puts it to bed. For one, when they say, what about the guy in the jungle? The first thing they're concerned about is if that person ever heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if they even knew anything concerning the word of God. That's the first thought. Well, what about that guy who never heard anything about the Lord? And then this is the second part. The second part is, will God send him to hell? Will God send the guy to hell who, who never heard the gospel out there? Will God send him to hell as well? And my, and my answer, listen, when I say this closely, my answer is no. God will not send that guy to hell because that guy does not exist. That guy does not exist. So God will not send someone to hell that does not exist. A person who comes into this world and never heard of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is impossible. It's impossible. So that guy will not go to hell because he doesn't exist. A guy in the jungle who never heard of the gospel and he dies without hearing anything about the Lord Jesus Christ, that guy does not exist in this world. The people are just making up things. And like I said, it's, some people are sincere, but people are just making up situations. What about the guy in the jungle? He never heard. God will not send him to hell because that guy doesn't exist. Everyone gets an opportunity. And I'm stepping on my, my own toes right now because I'm going to hit this point later on. But we're going to see that it is impossible because everyone has heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. You either heard or you will hear and get a chance to receive that gift of eternal life. So as I mentioned, this argument here. What about the guy in the jungle? It, it holds no water. And the reason why, for one, here's, I'm going to give you three quick points, and then the last two points I'm going to use as uh, quick applications to us. But statement number one, is if I'm looking to, uh, you know, go against and, and set a defense for the gospel's sake against people who would say, you know, what about the guy in the jungle? For one, we have to have some considerations that, number one, God's law 
God's word and his law is written in the hearts of every individual. God's law is written in the heart of every individual. Turn to Romans chapter 2. Everyone has the law of God written in their heart. Notice what the Bible says in Romans chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 12, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. You know, many people stop there. See, if you do the law, then you're justified. Look at what he said. Well, you know, I always put it to people this way. Just imagine if you live 100 years, uh, you, you make it to be 100 years old. And what this is saying is that, yes, you are justified, you know, if you keep the law. That means that every day for 100 years, every day of your life, you never sin. For 100 years, that's never having a bad thought. That is never, uh, you know, stealing, never telling a lie. Every day for 100 years, that's impossible. You break one law, you, you break it all. So, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Since we all have broken God's law and we all are sinners, guess what? Well, that's null and void now because we have broken the law. But then he says in verse 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts to meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Let's break that down. You say, well, that's a that's a mouthful. What is that saying? What he's saying in verse 14, for when the Gentiles, another word for the Gentiles is the world. OK, that's what he's saying. For when the world, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature things contained in the law. So what this is saying is that a person, let's say he's in the jungle. And he does not have a physical copy of the law. You have people who don't have the physical law of God as a physical copy, but yet by nature they are doing things that are contained in the law of God. You say, how does that look? Well, if a person, if you just ask them, hey, steal that piece of candy there, and they, they don't know anything about the law of God, and they just say, no, I'm not going to do that. You, well, why is that? What, what scripture do you have that say that you shouldn't steal that? And they say, well, I, I, it's just wrong. Well, where are you getting that from? You have people who are not saved, who don't know anything about adultery and remarriage and everything like that, who can get married and stay together until death do them part. And you just ask them, hey, divorce your wife and marry this one. Go commit adultery on your wife and, and sleep with any and every woman and any, any man out here. And then most people would say, no. Well, why is that? I just don't want to. What scripture do you have for that? I don't, well, where are you getting that thought from that you shouldn't commit adultery on your wife? You see what I'm saying? So by nature, they're doing things that are contained in the law, yet they don't even know the actual scripture, nor they don't have a physical copy of the law. He's saying in verse 14, for when the Gentiles which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Notice this, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. The law of God is written in the heart of every individual. Then he says, their conscience also bearing witness. So your conscience is linked to the word of God. So the reason why you may not know the thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, but yet you're doing by nature that I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to kill, I'm not going to deceive anybody. When you're doing that by nature, you're doing it because the word of God is in your heart, is written in your heart, and your conscience also is bearing witness. Your conscience is linked to the word of God. So that's why a person cannot have the physical copy of, of the word of God and not know all the scripture, yet doing things that are contained in the law, as the Bible say here. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30.
Deuteronomy chapter 30. And there's a tie in to the book of Romans chapter 10 here. Verse 11 says, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11 says, for this commandment, which I command thee this day. Now, what are we talking about? The commandment, the law of God. Notice that he said, this commandment, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over to, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Well, notice what he said here. He's saying with this law of God, with this commandment, you don't have to try to ascend up into heaven and try to and try to find it. You don't have to travel beyond the sea. You don't have to get a, a plane ticket or, or some type of uh, ticket on the ship to try to go find it beyond the sea. He says in verse 14, the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth, and notice this, and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. The law is written in your heart. Even if you don't know the actual scriptures, the law is written in the hearts of every individual. Now, turn to Exodus chapter 2. Let's look at an example of somebody who did not have a physical law in their hand, but yet they're doing things that is contained in the law. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, we have Moses. Moses is an adult now. And he is, he goes out in those days and he's, he's amongst his brother and he sees an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew. And Moses, of course, the law came through what? Came through who? Moses. The law was written and pinned down by Moses. At this point, Moses is not called into the ministry yet. He's about to flee when he kills this man. But then Moses right now don't have a physical law in his hand. He has not pinned down, thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill, thou shall not bear false witness. He has not pinned any of that down. But yet, we're about to see how the law is working in his heart. Verse 11 says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied, and spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked, notice this, this is how you can tell the law is written in his heart. And he looked this way and that way. I hope you caught that. He Spy an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. And verse 12 says, and he looked this way and that way. How does that look? Moses see his brother getting smote and he does this. Well, what does Moses eventually do here? He murders someone. He kills someone. But notice what he had to do first. See if anybody is looking. Well, can't you see the law working in his heart? What are you looking around for? If there is no law, just go and do it. Just go and murder him, and you can get away, uh, you can get away with it. But why are you looking around to see whether someone is watching? Because the law is written in your heart, thou shalt not kill. And this is an example how the law is working in his heart. And you can insert any situation here. Why does a thief come at night? If it's, if it's, you know, right, just do it any time of day. Why does a bank robber want to go in with a ski mask? If it's right, just go in there, you know, with no ski mask. Just go in there showing your face. But the reason they're looking this way and that way, even if they don't have the law, even if they don't know it, is because the law is written in your heart that you shouldn't steal, that you shouldn't kill. So Moses is looking this way and that way, although later on he's going to pin it down because God's word was already in the heart of Moses. 
as well as it is with any individual that comes into this world. You say, what does this have to do with the guy that's in the jungle? Because the guy that's in the jungle, it is impossible to say that he never knew anything about God. He never knew anything about God's law. No, because according to Romans chapter 2 and Deuteronomy chapter 30, the law is already in your heart. If you have a conscience, God's law is written in your heart and is linked to your conscience. Now, if your conscience has been seared with a hot iron, that's a different story. But before that conscience is seared, you had a conscience. You cannot sear a conscience if there is no conscience. So the guy in the jungle, he has the word of God written in his heart. He may not have a physical copy. He may not even know thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. He may not know any scripture, but what does he have in his heart? According to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 2 says that the law of God is written in his heart. For when the Gentiles, talking about the world, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts that meanwhile excuse, accusing or else excusing one another. That guy in the jungle, guess what? He has the law of God in his heart. That's the first thought to think about. Here's the second thought to think about when it comes to the guy in the jungle. You know, if you probably never knew, well, how do I answer that question? That's a very good question. What about the guy in the jungle? I don't know. Well, something to think about if you're writing notes or anything, the law of God is written in that person's heart. That's something that you can explain to someone. Here's something else that you can have in, in, your, in your ammo with you. Number two is the creation of God is used as a witness. The creation of God is used as as a witness, turn to Romans chapter 1. And as you turn to Romans chapter 1, I'm going to quote the Gospel of John chapter 1, talking about the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It says, all things were made by him. Who is him? The Lord Jesus Christ. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So the Lord Jesus Christ Yes, you have God the Father who is saying in Genesis, hey, let the light come forth. Bring forth the seeds. Bring forth the water. The Lord is telling him to bring it forth. But then someone actually laid the foundation. Someone actually did the handiwork. That was the Lord Jesus Christ who did the handiwork. Although God the Father said, let the waters come forth and so much and so on. But it was Jesus, as the Bible say, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The Bible says in the uh, book of Hebrews chapter one, talking about the Lord Jesus. But until the son, he said, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Wait, who loved righteousness and hated iniquity? The Lord Jesus Christ, who is the son. The context doesn't change. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, who is the context talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. The Lord Jesus Christ did the handiwork. And because he did the handiwork, we have creation Creation is also used to help aid someone to have the knowledge of God. God uses nature, uses his creation. Book of Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Who is he talking about? He's talking about man in general, mankind. That which may be known of God, whatever knowledge you may have of God, oh, I don't know anything about him. Wait a minute. It says that it's been manifested in them. How did he do this? For God had showed it unto them. How did he show it to them? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Well, how, how do we clearly see them? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The guy in the jungle can never say, I didn't know anything about the Lord. 
I didn't know anything about God, but wait a minute. You have his law written in your heart and you have his creation, which shows you that it's not a big bang, that these things just came from any and everywhere. The Bible says that the foundations were laid by the Lord Jesus Christ. The heavens are the works of thine hands. All these things are created. He said being understood by the things that are made. Well, where do you see that are made? You see the sun. You see the moon. You see the stars. Then you see a blue sky. The sky has color. Then you see uh, mountains. Then you see the seas. You see the oceans. There is so much that God has showed you to let you know that he exists so you will be without excuse. Turn to Acts chapter 14. Keeping up with that same thought. No excuse. Acts chapter 14. We have Paul and Barnabas. They're in, uh, they're in Lystra. And they perform a miracle. This guy is uh, crippled. If you want to go back on your own time, you'll see that in verse 8. In Acts chapter 14, verse 8. They heal this man. He's crippled. And these, the people of the city, they're just so excited. They figure that these guys are gods. And they figure, well, let's make a sacrifice unto them. And he says in verse 14, which when the apostles, excuse me, verse 13, then the priests, the priests of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of light passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Well, notice they come to these people here in Lystra and notice what they're telling them. You need to turn. Stop trusting in these vanities. They're, they're trusting in idolatry is what they're trusting in. And what Paul brings up and Barnabas, what they bring up is that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. But then notice what they call out specifically, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Well, why, why would they mention this right here? Maybe because you need to understand that the Godhead is not composed of your silver and your gold. And, and this is not God right here. But the God, the true and living God, is the one who has made the heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. The Lord uses these things. And this is what Paul bringing out here. He brings up nature and the creation of God because it helps you to understand that there is a God. So you have the law written in your heart and you have the creation of God as well. Notice what he say in verse 17, excuse me, verse 16, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, notice this. He left not himself without witness. In that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. Now, this is interesting, right? You say, why is Paul talking about creation? Why is he talking about nature here right now? Because he told them you should turn from these vanities. But then he's saying you need to turn to the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. And he says, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. He said in time past, he allowed you. He allowed you, though you were wrong. He allowed you to go off and walk in your own way. He says this. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. What is he saying? You, he let you go on your own way. He let you do what you wanted to do. But it's not like he didn't show you that he existed. That's what he's saying. He, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. Doesn't that sound like Romans chapter 1, so that they are without excuse? Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. Well, you say, well, well oh, hold on. How did God leave himself a witness that he existed? The exact same verse. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. Well, that food that you ate, where do you think that came from? That rain that comes down and nourishes the ground so food can grow, where do you think that came from? Then not only that, he said in fruitful seasons, even if you're talking about the actual fruit that grows, but then he says, and fruitful seasons. 
What about the four seasons that come around in this circuit every single year without fail? It gets cold every time of year. At the same time, it's getting cold. At the same time of the year, it is getting, uh, at a certain time of the year, it's getting warm. Then it gets hot, and then it gets cold again. Then it gets hot again. The Bible says, thou has created summer and winter, as the Bible says in the book of Psalms. So he's saying, God has given us these seasons as well. But at the beginning of the verse, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. No one will ever be able to say, I had no idea. So that they are without excuse. God has used creation as well. Psalm chapter 97. Psalm chapter 97. Verse 1, the Bible says, the Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of owls be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. Only a couple people, some people see his glory. No, and all the people see his glory. What about the guy in the jungle? Yeah, he has a word of God in his heart. He sees the glory of God. Didn't the Bible say the heavens are the glory of God? The firmament as, uh, you know, uh, the, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. All the people see his glory. Doesn't matter where you are you will experience the glory, the creation of God. This ties back into Psalm chapter 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Everyone, regardless of where you are, you see trees, you see sun, moon, stars, and skies, you are experiencing the creation of God, and therefore you are without excuse. Your boy in the jungle has no excuse. Here's the third point here. Not only does the guy in the jungle has the word of God, the law of God written in his heart. Not only does he has a creation of God as a witness, but then number three, <clears throat> he has the gospel as well. He has the gospel. Every individual that comes into this world will have an opportunity to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, whether you receive the gift or reject the gift, that is on you. But you can never say that I did not get an opportunity. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And while you turn there, I'll just quote what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Acts chapter 1. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He's saying this gospel is going to start here in Jerusalem, and then you're going to hit Judea, and then you're going to hit Samaria, and then just go out into the uttermost part of the earth. Colossians chapter 1. With the guy in the jungle in mind. God, uh, Colossians chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 3, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bring forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So notice what he said, this church of Coloss. He's saying the word of the truth, the gospel, he said, notice this, it has come unto you, 
which is outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judea, outside of Samaria. This is over across the Mediterranean Sea. The gospel has reached over to them. And he said, this gospel here, he says, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. As it is in all the world. What about the guy in the jungle? Is he in the world? Well, the gospel is going out to him as well. With the same thought, jump down to verse 21. And you, who is you? Talking about the church of Colossus. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I hope you guys are paying attention to this. How many people received the gospel? Was it just a couple? Was it just a few? The end of verse 23, he says concerning the gospel, which he had heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. With the same thought here, it doesn't change. Look at verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Well, what's the mystery? The, a mystery is something that's hidden. Well, what's the mystery? What is this mystery that is now revealed unto the Gentiles? He says here, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, well, who is the whom talking about? Christ Jesus. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. How many times did we see the word every? Warning every man, teaching every man, and he's talking about presenting every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Would that include the guy in the jungle? I, I believe it would. Turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens. And this is where he's there alone. And he sees the city wholly given to idolatry. His spirit, his heart is stirred up. And he decides that he's going to start to preach to them. And in verse 28, the Bible says, he's talking about God. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Well, how can a guy who never heard the gospel repent? And let me clear it up. This repent is not talking about repenting your sin. In case someone is out there thinking, well, clear it up. He's not talking about repenting of your sins. This is very similar to Acts chapter 14, where this is a nation that is worshiping idols. They're caught up in idolatry, and that's why in verse 29 he's talking about don't think that the Godhead is, is going to, I would just say, composed of silver and stone and engraven by art and man's device. He's saying you need to turn from that. Your, your golden Buddha statue, that, that's not God. He's saying you need to repent from believing in that. And he says in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. How, how can God have a man or a woman who's in a jungle to repent of anything if they're not getting the opportunity to hear the gospel? You can't command them to repent. And he said everywhere, all men everywhere to repent. That, that is not logical. That logically can't happen if a guy in the jungle is not getting an opportunity. This verse doesn't even make sense then.
Look at verse 31. Why is God commanding all men everywhere to repent? Why is that? Well, verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man. Who is that man? The Lord Jesus Christ, whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath notices given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. See, I, I hope I feel like running out of here. <laughs> Pay close attention to what he just said. If you were not paying attention, listen to what he said. He's commanding everyone to repent. Because verse 31, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. Assurance unto all men. What is that assurance? In that he hath raised him from the dead. Uh, like I said, I feel like running around here. We're not, you know, for those who visit, it's not a Pentecostal church, you know, but sometimes the word get fiery. You know, and this and this subject is near and dear to me because what he just said is that God says here he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. All men have been assured of the resurrection of Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying. You have been assured. What about the guy in the jungle who never heard? Oh, he's been assured of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he died for his sins and how he has been resurrected. Paul says here, well, just think about this. How, how is it that all men have assurance that Christ Jesus was resurrected? Because you think about it, I think this is logical for someone to say, well, I wasn't there. How do I know that he was raised? I was not like Thomas who seen the holes in his hand, and I was not like Thomas who thrust his finger in his side. I didn't get that experience. So how do I know that he was resurrected? Well, here's the thing. You're placing your faith on the scriptures. Because the scriptures say that he was resurrected. Jesus himself said he would rise again. The eyewitnesses said that the tomb was empty. We have the scriptures and you place your faith on the scriptures. The Bible says, for I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is your faith on? The scriptures. And, you know, I like to use this because also in it, every now and then someone, and, it's, and I, it's a logical question. I was not there. How do I know he was resurrected? You're placing your faith on the scriptures. You don't have to be like Thomas, who I need to see it physically. You know what? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, as the scriptures say. We're placing our faith on the scriptures. You say, well, that's New Testament. What about the Old Testament? Well, let's go to the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 98. And while you turn there, I'll just quote Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It said that grace that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, including your guy in the jungle, if there is a guy in the jungle. Psalm chapter 98, verse 1 through 3. Let's see it here. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. Well, what is the heathen? Another word for the world. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. This is the Old Testament. And yet, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. This is not talking about, because was everybody there to see the salvation that God wrought when Pharaoh was chasing them at the Red Sea? No, everybody was not there. So this is not talking about that salvation. Now, did people hear of this story? Absolutely, yes. But the salvation is not that what he's talking about. 
All the ends of the, world, of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. You say, well, how can that be? Uh, well, dating back to Genesis 4, what does it say? Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. In Genesis 4, people were seeing the salvation of the Lord. Because the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if men in Genesis chapter 4 began to call upon the name of the Lord, which the name of the Lord at that time was God Almighty, he was not known by the name of Jehovah at that time. And now the name that is uh, above every name is the Lord Jesus Christ. They were saved by calling upon God Almighty because that was his name. Men began to call upon the name of the Lord even in Genesis. So this makes sense when he say all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Your guy in the jungle has no excuse. He has no excuse. He has the law of God written in his heart or her heart. They want to say, what about the lady in the jungle? You have the law of God written in the heart. You have the creation of God day and day, night unto night. Creation shows you so that you're without excuse. Then you have the gospel, which we see is being preached to every creature under heaven. All the ends of the world have seen, our, have seen the salvation of our God. I mean, the God over and over, we've even seen in Colossians, warning every man, teaching every man, presenting every man in Christ Jesus. It's over and over. And here's the thought, well, that guy in the jungle, you know, he's just reading, you know, uh, he doesn't hear any. I mean, we have two situations, if you're thinking like me, Acts chapter 8, where a guy is literally from Africa, from Ethiopia, and he's in a chariot reading, and God sends someone to him. I mean, if that guy in the jungle really want to get saved, what do you think God is going to do? Going to send someone so he can get saved. Well, what about the Italian people, the Italian? Uh, you ever heard a centurion named Cornelius, head of the Italian band, who's seeking God? He's a devout man, and yet God sends a man named Peter. It seemed like people who earnestly and sincerely want to see God and want to experience the salvation and want to know the truth of God, seem like those people get saved. Amen. I can speak for myself. I was under listening to many false prophets. I'll just name one, Billy Graham. I was a big Billy Graham listener, right? But I'm seeking truth. I'm trying to know the truth. And you know what God got to me? Because I was seeking the truth and wanted to know the truth. Got me the truth. Led me to salvation by faith alone in Christ Jesus Christ. Excuse me, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are seeking to know the Lord, it doesn't matter where you're at. Wherever you are, God will get the gospel to you. So the guy in the jungle, guess what? He still has no excuse. Two quick applications for us, and we're done. <clears throat> you say, well, what does this have to do with me? Because, you know, the guy in the jungle, I, I, I didn't know much. I didn't see these scriptures. You know, even if you just say, I didn't know how to answer that question, if, if, I, if I'm ever coming across that. You know, what does this have to do with me now? You know, because uh, help me out. Well, here's one thought to keep in mind. You don't have to go to the jungle to get people saved. You don't have to go to the jungle to get people saved. Gospel of John chapter 4. Gospel of John chapter 4. Jesus just finished speaking with the woman at the well. She went back and told the whole city, Come see a man who, who told me everything I ever done. The disciples come back and they offer him food. The Bible says in verse 34, Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. What the Lord is saying is, don't say, you know, four months and then I'll start, you know, start laboring, start bringing in the harvest. It'll be ready in, in four months. The Lord is saying, no, nah, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields. He's saying they're white right now. He's talking about souls. He's saying people are ready and willing to get saved right now. All you need to do is lift up your eyes and look on the fields. And don't say that, oh, just uh, another time 
it'd be it'd be the perfect time. He said he's saying, no, right now. It's the time it, it's ready. See, it's the thing. You don't have to go to China. You don't have to go to Hong Kong. You don't have to go to Singapore. You don't have to go to to the jungles of Tanzania to get people saved. But if you just lift up your eyes and look on the fields here in Atlanta, you know what you will come across? People that are from Africa, people that are from China, people that are from Australia, people that are from the Ukraine. I've met and worked with people from Ukraine. I didn't have to go to Ukraine. You don't have to go to the jungle to get people saved. You just think about, I, I was with, um, with Brother Austin. Over here in Clarkston, if you all remember Sunday soul in Clarkston, what was over in Clarkston? A lot of Africans, right? Then what were they? A lot of them, Islamic. I don't have to go to Dubai. I don't have to go to Saudi Arabia and find the guy in the jungle. All I have to do is lift up my eyes, look on the fields, go out, and you will come across people from all these different nations. Monday night group right now. We're in Duluth. And I'm glad, thank you, Brother Josh, for the little, little QR codes and everything because there's different languages on there. But you know of any ethnicity we've been knocking the door of out there? Asian. Hispanic. Asian is a lot. Whether it's Asian, Vietnamese, Korean, it's a lot of them all in there. We did not have to buy a plane ticket to go to the jungles of Vietnam to get someone saved. But they're right here in front of us. I got a personal story I can remember. I, I, we had um, been in our neighborhood uh, maybe for about a, maybe about a year or so at this time. And I had started knocking the doors in my neighborhood, starting on my block and then, you know, expanding from there on. And by the time the next summer came, I had moved up the street. And I came across a, a young guy. He was 17 at the time. And he opens up the door. I speak with him. And the guy, the, the kid is from Vietnam. He's from Vietnam. Talk about the jungle. Vietnam, I mean, you know, so the kid is from Vietnam. Never heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never knew anything about, you know, the gospel and, and how Christ died for his sins and was resurrected. He said, I, I don't know anything. He's, he, he was, I think, maybe about a month in America now. So he had been here from Vietnam. He said, I've, I've been here for about a month now. He spoke good English, too. So I'm like, okay, good. Well, he knew nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ. But as the words say, today is the day of salvation. The day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. This is what's funny. I didn't think about this until I was working on this message. The guy never heard anything about the Lord, never read the Bible or anything. But when I started to question him about lying, and is he a liar? Yeah, I'm a liar. Is it wrong to lie? Yeah. Where are you getting that from? Is the law written in his heart? Absolutely. That was a good example of someone who did not have the word, but yet that law was written in his heart. And what did the Bible say? The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Well, him never hearing anything about the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, somebody, oh, what about the guy in the jungle from Vietnam who today was his day and he got saved, praise the Lord. Never heard the Lord Jesus Christ, but the law working in his heart led him to the Savior so he can be justified by faith. Amen. Here's another one. I'm getting my Joel Osteen on right now with all the stories right now. <laughs> another story I have. It's the last one. Out soul winning years back, and the guy opened up the door. I'm trying to give him the gospel. And he, out of nowhere, well, what about the guy in the jungle? What about the guy in the jungle who never heard of the Lord? He literally asked me that question. And two things I told him, and, and something for us to think about. I said, wait, well, here's the thing. Let's not worry about the guy in the jungle. Because this guy right here was not saved. You're not saved, and you worried about a guy in the jungle. 
how about you get right first? And then this was the second thing I told him. If we get you saved, you know what you can do? You can go over there to the jungle and you can get him saved. If your heart is so concerned about the guy in the jungle, how about we start with you? And I'm trying to keep him focused on you, on you. Yeah, but the guy in the jungle, I'm like, is he not understanding that you're not saved? But you're worried about someone else. And eventually, what did he say? No, nah, I'm good. Oh, okay, well, have fun with the guy in the jungle then. You know, he, he didn't want to get saved. Well, you and your buddy in the jungle can partner up. <laughs> but the first thought we need to understand is that you don't have to go to the jungle to get people saved. As the Lord Jesus Christ say, says, lift up your eyes, look on the fields. We got all type of ethnicity and people from everywhere here in this Atlanta area. Here's the second thing. You know, you get that person saved from Korea or from Africa, Ethiopia, wherever. You know what they can do then? Take it back to their loved ones. They can take it back to those jungles. You know, sincerely, when I say this, they may have family that are over in, in China and over in Hong Kong and maybe in areas where it's not as, you know, populated and it's, it's a pretty quiet and, and maybe small country town. So I, I don't know. But if that person gets saved, you know what they can do? They can take it back to their family. Then tying in with this is that if every church would do their responsibility to carry out the gospel of Jesus Christ. If every church would make sure they fulfill the Great Commission, this statement would not exist. What about the guy in the jungle? If every church did their responsibility, this question doesn't exist. Because if someone would say, what about the church over in South Africa? If every church was doing their responsibility, you would say, oh, it's the church over in South Africa. I'm not worried. Pastor Bogart is over there in South Africa. What, what else you got next? Oh, oh what about uh, the jungles of Botswana? Oh, don't worry. Pastor Anson did that years ago. Many people got saved. Oh, okay, what about the Philippines? Oh, look at our program. But Brother Matthew, Matthew Suggy's over in the Philippines. It, it seemed like wherever you go, wherever a church is planted, if a church is doing what it should be doing, you know what? That question does not exist. So the Baptist church that is in China needs to be holding this responsibility. The Baptist church that is over in North Africa needs to handle its responsibility. The churches that are here in this area need to handle its responsibility. That question, the guy in the jungle, does not exist if every church does their responsibility. Because that means that every man is getting warned and every man is getting taught. So just wanted to talk about your, your good friend in the jungle because it's often, a, a, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a good question, but people use it to be combative against the gospel. And, and hopefully, you know, as I went through these verses, hopefully you, you learned something and, you know, something you can keep with you when, whenever someone, you know, wants to bring that up. You know, make mention that, hey, we have the law of God is written in that person's heart. And he had the creation of God. He's without excuse. And yet today is the day of salvation. You can get saved. I'm here with the gospel right now. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you and ask um, that, Lord, we continue to study to show ourselves approved, Lord God. And um, asking, Lord, that we will be mindful, Lord, to preach this gospel everywhere as you have told us to, Lord God. Um, we ask that churches that, are, that have the right gospel, Lord, that they would step up to the plate. And, Lord, we don't want to hide our gospel, Lord. It doesn't help anyone if we're in these rural areas or in city areas and we're withholding the gospel, Lord. We don't have to go to the jungles. But as your word say, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, Lord. The, the harvest is white already unto harvest, Lord God. We thank you. As you bless the soul winning this uh, afternoon and the evening service as well. In Jesus' name, amen.